More than 8,000 Starbucks stores closed down across the country today so that its employees, 180,000 plus, could get anti-bias training. This comes after an incident last month that raises again the question of individual biases in all of us. Yamish Alcindor begins with this update. The implicit bias training that Starbucks is doing today is aimed at reducing racial discrimination and stereotypes even those we may harbor unconsciously. We understand that racial and systemic bias have many causes, sources, and ways of showing up within each of us. As seen in this video from Starbucks, the training is grounded in the idea that communities thrive when there is a, quote, third place other than home or work to congregate. Immediately, I shut down, I froze. It includes an introduction by the rapper Common. Helping people see each other fully, completely, respectfully. The action by Starbucks comes after an incident in April that sparked national outrage and protest. Starbucks coffee is A store manager at this Philadelphia Starbucks called the police on two black men who were there for a business meeting. But the manager became alarmed after they requested a bathroom key without ordering anything. Well, what did they do? What did they do? The men explained they were waiting on a friend's arrival to order, but by the time the friend arrived, the men were in handcuffs, arrested for trespassing. The company released a video apology after the arrest. I want to begin by offering a personal apology to the two gentlemen who were arrested in our store. Today on CBS This Morning, Starbucks chairman and founder Howard Schultz responded to some skepticism that the training is a PR stunt and does not go far enough. As I shared with you in Philadelphia, it was a reprehensible situation that we took complete ownership of and something that really was embarrassing, horrifying, and all the issues that we talked about that day. It's interesting to me for us to be criticized for doing it for four hours. It's just the beginning. What we've said to our board, to our shareholders, is that we are deeply committed to, me, to making this part of everything we do. We hire 100,000 new people a year. This is going to be part of the onboarding training. We're going to globalize this. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Yamiche Alcindor. For a closer look at this issue and how much training or education can do to help people overcome it, we turn to two people closely involved in these issues. Amrita Chakrabarty Myers is an associate professor of history and gender studies at Indiana University. She's currently on a fellowship at the Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University. And Patricia Devine is a professor of psychology and director of the Prejudice and Inter group relations lab at the University of Wisconsin and we welcome both of you to the news hour I'm Rita Myers I'm going to start with you let's talk about bias uh, I think it's safe to assume we all have bias inside of us we're human how do you define it where does it come from thanks Judy it's a pleasure to be on and yes I think you're right Judy we um we soak bias in through the very culture that we live in, Judy. And for those of us who were born and raised in the United States, we certainly get it from our families, from our parents. We soak it in from media, television, news, books, um, our teachers in our classrooms. Um, and we call it implicit or unconscious because it's done so subtly that we're not even aware that we're picking it up. And by the time we're adults, um, we have these unconscious ideas or thoughts or stereotypes. If you were to ask someone if, um, if they're racist or if they have bias against a group of people like African Americans, they may well say to you no, um, but then you know, they may well have these stereotypes. They might be something as small as thinking that all African Americans like watermelon or fried chicken, or it might be something far more damaging or severe uh, thinking that, you know, that African-American men are, are dangerous, are criminals. Um, they, you know, people might clutch their bags, for example, and unconsciously and may not even be aware of it when um, African-Americans pass by them on the street or when they get onto an elevator with them. And these are things that they may not be aware of, um, but they've picked up these ideas from, um, from the culture in which they reside. Patricia Devine, uh, it, you're, you accept the idea that most people don't realize they have these biases inside of them. 
I do. In fact, I would argue that most people don't want to have those biases. They intend to be non-prejudiced or non-biased, and yet, as the previous guest was describing, they've learned stereotypes, they've picked them up from cultures to the point that they get so uh, deeply entrenched in their minds that they become default or habitual ways of thinking about others. And I use the metaphor of habits of mind as a starting point for understanding the problem and also as a starting point for trying to address how one might reduce the tendency to show these unintentional forms of bias. So Patricia Devine, staying with you, how then do you mm -hmm. get people to recognize it and then get them to begin to change their thinking, change their behavior? Well, the first thing is to get people just to notice that, in fact, spontaneously and unintentionally, they make assumptions about other people. Their conscious minds may not approve, but once they become tuned into these uh, types of biases and, and are made aware of them, then they come to understand them as a problem to be addressed. And once they accept that, and, and one point to really recognize here is that Having these biases doesn't make people bad people. It makes them rather ordinary, having been socialized into a culture where these biases are uh, embedded into the very fabric of our society. They're picking up the messages. They're not bad people. They're ordinary. And that once you understand the problem that way, you can make a commitment to change, and you can start to think about the change process. If they are habits of mind, they can be broken like other habits can. And there's a number of interrelated uh, mm -hmm. factors that have to be uh, uh, set in place. People have to care. They have to be motivated. They have to want to do something. Without motivation, nothing will happen. They need to become tuned into, aware, and notice when they're vulnerable to displaying biases. They have to have some tools or strategies to do right. something else, to disrupt that that habitual way of thinking. And then, like breaking any other habit, they're going to have to put effort into it over time. It's not something that happens all at once. There's not sort of a quick fix or a silver bullet, but we can empower people to make the change and we can provide them with assistance uh, in the process to overcome these unintentional biases. So Amrita Myers, I see you nodding for while you're listening to her. You're saying, both of you are saying, it is possible to change behavior. It just takes work and it takes a desire on the part of the person. Absolutely, I think that you have to want to do these things. You have to be willing. I talk to my students about these things all the time. I teach African American history. I teach black women's history. I teach classes on slavery. And every semester I have students who come in who have never taken these classes before, who, who will openly express the fact that they've never gone to school with students of color, who have never had teachers of color. They're often very resistant to the very material I'm teaching. And they'll often say that they've never heard this material, that they often think that it's not even true. Um, because they've come from school districts where they've actually been taught alternative uh, material. And so they find it hard to believe what they're reading, uh, what they're hearing from their classmates and their experiences. And yet, over the course of the semester, being in small groups, reading this material, reading primary documents, hearing about their classmates' experiences, hearing from me, they begin to open up and they begin to le learn another way. Can one session change someone? Can it change your thinking? No, I think what one session can do is it can cause a, an epiphany. It's a beginning. Um, but it has to be, it's a start. A one, one day cannot do anything but be a beginning, but a beginning is important. Right, it has to be the beginning of a lifelong process. But we've seen that happen with people, you know, there are many of us have read stories online of people who used to be white supremacists who are now engaged with uh, organizations like the NAACP, the Equal Justice Initiative, and other wonderful organizations who are now working with others to bring about change. Right, they have amazing transformational stories, but it all begins with a single step. What Starbucks has done today is taken a first step. But it has to be, be the first step in, another, in a long process. And just quickly, Patricia Devine, you agree one session is at least a start? It's a good thing? I think it's not the issue of whether it's one session. The issue is whether it engages people in a deep and meaningful way in the, in the issues, and, in, and it provides them with tools that could empower them to create a self-sustaining process of change that can uh, last over time. Patricia Devine, I'm... I'm Rita Myers. We thank you both. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Judy.